Let me do that first. Okay. So I'm very happy already that a bunch of you sent in uh, emails with corrections and uh, uh, that's very good because I can fix them. And um, then I wanted to spend a couple of minutes, not too long, just a couple of minutes on confidence intervals since that was brought up. And I thought I can share one slide on that. Okay. So, okay. So we had our likelihood function or log likelihood over some parameter. Uh, here it's in this plot, it's mu before it was alpha. And so we, the question was, uh, what about least squares or some other maximum likelihood procedure? And it's confidence intervals. How, how are they different? What do they do? And how do they relate to these Bayesian posterior distributions? Okay. So let me just explain what's going on in, in that maximum likelihood framework. So you have your likelihood function. Um, it's some, some shape. You find the maximum of that function with some optimizer. And that's your estimator of mu. So it's mu hat. And I put here D for the data we used. And then to construct a confidence interval, you, uh, on this parabola, you go down um, by a delta log likelihood of uh, minus one on both sides. And that defines your confidence interval. And now the Wilkes theorem says the following. If you, if that mu d, that, that one that you estimated here, if that one was the true one and you generated many, many data sets under this value and each of these data sets you fitted and found their, um, their maximum likelihood, and for each of them, um, you would make this uh, confidence interval. Then the true value, this mu d that we used to generate these data sets, this mu d is contained in those uh, confidence intervals 68% of the time. Okay. So we made a bunch of assumptions and, and Wilkes theorem to, for this to hold, um, we made a bunch of assumptions. So first of all, um, the, the log likelihood has to, has, this, has to have this Gaussian shape, at least where we are interested in it. So it cannot be cut off, cannot, cannot be at the boundary. Then the model has to be linear in the parameters. And that's also the case if, the number of data sets is extremely high. In that case, the, the likelihoods tend to become Gaussian. But you don't necessarily know when that is exactly because it depends on your model. Maybe it produces weird shapes. And we also assumed that this uh, is the true parameter, the one that we found for our actual data set. And if those conditions are all true, all of them need to be true, then you get this confidence interval, which tells you how this estimator of mu is distributed, assuming this true value. And uh, good, but remind, let's remind ourselves what our question was about the inference. We want to know the probability distribution of the true value out there in the universe, given the data. And we don't necessarily want to assume that the best fit we found underlies the universe. So there's a bit of a question whether these conditions are fulfilled and we don't make this assumption in, in Bayesian inference and Bayesian inference does answer actually the question you're interested in. But there is something very useful here 
which is um, testing how often your method gives the right answer. So here, the idea is that you generate a bunch of data sets and you look how your inference procedure works. And you can do this also with Bayesian methods. So you, you make this sort of characterization of Bayesian methods and that's calibration. And we'll come back to that in the second week. But until then, um, let's, let's assume we're doing Bayesian inference and let's talk about credible intervals and probability distributions. And if you're interested in this and the differences and so forth, what I also want to show you is as we saw, is if you in the folder go to the books and papers notebook. Um, I put here a bunch of books and uh, links. Uh, if you want to read more about various topics or if you want to have the material presented differently. And here are some books um, on Bayesian inference written for general audience. And this one, for example, is very long, but good and um, available for download. And then here are a bunch of um, books written for people working in, in physics or in astrophysics who are interested in this. And, and they, of course, use a slightly different language, so it might be more accessible for you. And in particular, this book talks a lot about what's the difference between confidence and credible intervals, how do Bayesian and maximum likelihood methods relate. So if you're interested in this, uh, it, it's not a very thick book, so uh, I would recommend having a look at this. And these two are very commonly recommended by people. And then here are a bunch of other people's lectures and courses. So if you want to have uh, a look there, you can do that. And down here, I put uh, links to a bunch of papers. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do in the sort of second half of this week is to go through some of these papers and discuss what uh, researchers currently are thinking about, what they're struggling with um, in these methods and how to improve them and, and what the limitations are and how to diagnose them. And so for each uh, method that I will introduce, there are sort of state-of-the-art references here. And, and uh, you, can, you can already have a look, but I will uh, scroll through some of these papers and we'll, we'll have a look what people are interested in at the moment. Okay. Any urgent questions or concerns right here? Otherwise, I would move on. We have also gained the capability of making breakout rooms. And, oh, and I wanted, oh yes, so there might, I, might, I probably made a mistake there for, uh, where was this? So here it's a delta chi-square of one and then a delta log likelihood of a half. Yes, that's a typo. Thank you. Okay, so let's pick up where we were. So we made probability distributions and we did a bunch of stuff with it. And now we wanted not just to do this in one dimension, but also in across multiple parameters. So we so far made a, a, a many simplifying assumptions. We assumed that beta is exactly minus three. And we also assumed something about the period uh, uncertainty. So how accurate our measurement was. We assumed that there's no metallicity and now we want to loosen some of these assumptions and we'll start with beta. And so we also want beta to be a free parameter. So we will define 
a grid also over that. So here's my beta grid. It goes from minus five to two. I again assume it's uh, a flat prior in this case. Here is the center point of each grid step and the width of each grid step. <clears throat> and I will need that to define probability masses. And here is the combination uh, of the alphas and the betas. And this is the size of each of these cells. Let me just uh, show you. I should be able to plot this grid somehow like this, I think. Yep. Yep, so you see very dense in, what is this? This is alpha. And then here we have beta and that's our grid. Okay. <clears throat> Now we compute our likelihood function at each of those grid points. And we multiply on our prior density for each grid point. It's, it's exactly the same as we did before. We sum up the uh, posterior for the normalizing factor for the evidence. We make sure the posterior is normalized and it is, okay. And now we plot our posterior distribution. And here it is, so alpha and beta, and in gray, you see the posterior probability on it. And what I've done here is I've summed over all beta values. So I've summed up this array upwards. And so this is called marginalization. So here we have the marginal probability distribution um, over alpha. And here's the same thing, but over beta. So I sum up over all the alpha possibilities. And here's the probability distribution of beta. And before we had beta of minus three, which is a bit down here. So remember we said the alpha was a bit um, too, high, too high, yes. And now you see it allows slightly lower alpha values if we have beta a bit closer to the actual uh, simulated value. So that's um, marginal posterior distributions and conditional probability distributions. And you see in this very dense grid, there's a tiny, only a very tiny region of the parameter space that has most of the probability. And now we used something like a hundred times more um, points to add an additional parameter. And so you, you can imagine if you add more and more parameters, every time it gets a hundred times more computationally costly because you have to evaluate the likelihood function more and more often, this is not feasible. You cannot do 20 dimensional inference with this kind of grid approach. And that's exactly the motivation to do these um, uh, Monte Carlo inference methods that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> um, here are some words about this normalizing factor that so far we just used to normalize, but it actually has some interesting properties. And now we can look at those. <clears throat> so we have the evidence from one model where we had just alpha being a free parameter. And we have the evidence computed for the second model where alpha and beta are free parameters. And here are their values. Um, for beta fixed, it's this, and for beta Varying, so beta also being a free parameter, is this value. And what you can do now is, if you if you look at this again, 
you have the probability of the data given a model. Um, you can again apply a Bayes theorem and multiply this by the probability of a model. So up here we have probability of the data given a model and a prior on the models, on the, that model. And then on the left here, you have a posterior on the model. So the probability that that model is the correct one given the data. And on the bottom again, we have a normalizing factor, which is just summing up over all the models. In this case, we only have two. And uh, if we, and that's sort of interesting because then you have a probability for that model to be the true one, but we have to choose priors on the models. So let's assume we have, let's assume we say that first model where beta is fixed, we uh, strongly prefer, uh, sorry, we, we strongly, um, uh, so, sorry, the other one we strongly prefer. We strongly prefer the one where beta varies. And we're going to use an odds ratio of that um, model one to model two is one over two, one to 200. Sorry, one to 100. Uh, I'll just evaluate this so the ratio is 0 0.01. The prior probability on one on the model one is. 1% and for model two, it's 99%. That's our prior, let's say. And then we get posterior model probabilities. <clears throat> and so they are slightly different. They've been slightly moved, but still the second model has the higher probability. Now, how much did it change from here to here? That can be quantified by the base factor. And the base factor is just the ratio of these said evidences. So it's the evidence ratio. Okay, so here we can compute the base factor. It's just exponential of the log differences. And the base factor is um, 0 0.5. So from these evidences, slightly shifted in favor of the second model, because in that case you have uh, the parameter can can fit a bit closer to the true value. And if that base factor is very close to one, and here it is, not so different by order of magnitude from one, you could say there's not much evidence in favor of one or the other model. And now you already recognize what the limitations of these methods are, probably. So one nice thing about it is that if you use evidences and base factors, because you're integrating over the entire parameter space, so let me show you this again. So you're integrating the likelihood over the entire parameter space here. You look at the likelihood everywhere. Um, you are sort of quantifying the entire ability of the model to describe your data. You're not just looking at the best fit. And so it captures the entire parameter space, not just the best fit. And if you have a model like this one, which in some regions of the parameter space makes completely different models that are not realized in the data. So you have all of this parameter space that makes completely different shapes. So they have very low likelihood that's being punished. So it's because that suppresses your integral. You have additional volume. And so the volume here is very small. And um, so the integral goes down, the larger this unrealized volume is. So those are the nice thing. It pun this base factors punish the model diversity, so what it can predict. But there are limitations. So first of all, you have to assume parameter priors and how these parameter priors uh, are defined strongly affects uh, these evidence values. So for example, if we defined our prior very narrow here, we would get a completely different integral. So it's very sensitive to how you define your parameter priors. And um, 
then if you have these odds ratios, so for example, if you have these ratios that tell you, okay, in this case, it's 0.5% and 0.5% and 99.5% probability that that model is the true one, that sort of gives you betting odds or the relative probabilities. <clears throat> but what it doesn't tell you is, if you now take this result and you decide, I think uh, model two is the correct one and I do something else with it, how often you would be wrong by making that decision? How, so what's your rate of falsely selecting model two based on these results? These numbers are not the same as the false selection rate. So um, because Bayesian inference does not make any decisions, it just weighs probabilities, the posterior odds don't state the probability of making a false decision based on this information. So for that, you would need a frequentist characterization. And we will talk about that uh, next week. But this sort of closes the overall introduction to Bayesian inference. And um, we will now sort of ignore all of this and just focus on integration methods that can deal with these multidimensional parameter spaces to estimate these quantities that we're interested in. So I would uh, like to take a 10 minute break here and ask you to fill out this form and then move on to this important sampling notebook and start plotting the log likelihood function uh, in this cell, in this to do by you cell. And we're gonna try out break, um, splitting you up into breakout rooms and um, yeah, you can, you can get started on this where we have this sort of banana function as a toy function over our likelihood space or over our parameter space. Before I break into breakout rooms, oh, I see there are some, okay. Are there any questions at this point? Johannes, maybe you quickly can uh, repeat one thing which I might have missed. Uh, we see that one model is worse than other. What is the main number I can uh, give uh, for the comparison? I mean, um, what, is a, what is the number that summarizes that one model is worse than other? Right. So what you have here is it's basically this, or here's the formula. So for each model, you can compute its posterior um, probability. And here we computed the posterior probability for model one versus model two. So it's basically the ratio of those two is called the posterior odds ratio. And that's the relative probability of those two models. So this is only a comparison among models relative to each other. So it's not an absolute criticism of one particular model. And for those, we will have more discussion next week. So then the number I get is 10 to minus, uh, four to 10 to minus three, right? Uh, how do I interpret this number? Um, so if you take... I mean, the second one is almost one. So it's actually the first number gives the, the result. Yeah. So let me just uh, copy these. I think the bracket is missing. Uh, the last one you should delete. You see the red? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yes, you're right. <clears throat> so, what you have here is 
some number, zero point, let's say 0.5%. And what it means is that model one is 0.5%, sorry, is this times more probable than model two or the other way around. Model two is 200 times more probable to be the true one than model A. All right, thanks. But keep in mind under these assumptions we made, we already assumed we started with it being 100 times more probable than model one. That's why you have to pay attention to these limitations. You have to choose a lot of priors and all of these limitations come. Very good, thank you. More questions? You can also put them in the chat if you want. Okay, good. Then um, you know what to do. Fill out this form, move on to important sampling, plot this function. And I will assign you to breakout rooms now. So you said 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, we come back to your yes. continuations of your lecture? That's correct. So let's say quarter to two, three. Um, yeah, we can do, yep, quarter to, sorry, what did you say? Well, quarter in 15 two, minutes, three. quarter to yes. three. Yes, that's good. Yeah, 1445. And we'll make four bracket rooms. And uh, let's see if that works. Okay. And Are you, David, are you having issues connecting to the rooms? Oh, okay. 45, yes, okay. So welcome back. Um, now we will talk about important sampling. And um, let me just uh, share my screen here. So uh, before we talked about Bayesian inference and all these good stuff. And now we will sort of forget all about this uh, and just use a toy likelihood function all over a parameter space and try out different methods to integrate and to get posterior probability distributions. And so we will use this um, parameter space, uh, which has length one in each dimension. And we will use some, sort of this uh, toy banana function to uh, to have a, a toy problem to work with. And so here it is, it's based on the, on the Rosenbrock function. And uh, let's, and here is how you, how you call this function. And it's defined over the domain minus half to a half so that the integration bounds are of length one, makes it a bit simpler. And at the moment we only use two dimensions and you can try later to go to 10 or 20 dimensions and see how the methods fall apart 
and um, uh, but at the moment we stick with two dimensions and 
Okay, welcome back. Um, Johannes Diel will present one possible solution to this exercise. Please go ahead. Okay, let me just share my screen. Um, you should be seeing my Firefox now. Yes. Yep. Hopefully the size is big enough. So um, measure the variance in the integral, estimate by running the method a few times. I hope none of you has run the method by hand a few times and wrote down what the resulting z value was, because you can do that easily in a for loop. And essentially just copy paste the um, couple of lines that you see in the notebook uh, above um, to calculate the, the value of, of z. And so if we run this, it hopefully runs and produces a variance of around 10 to the power of minus seven. I think my PC doesn't like me <laughs> anymore because he's uh, occupied with screen sharing. Anyways, um, yes, exactly, 10 to the power of minus seven. So um, for 1b, we had to vary the number of samples drawn. So we essentially do what we did in A, again, for now a couple of different values for of n draw and two, two for loops, essentially. Um, once to calculate the variance for a specific number of draws and once for all of these different values of the number of draws. And then if we plot this, it should look like this. So if the number of samples that we are drawing goes up, the variance of the integral goes down, which is as what we expect, um, because it should converge to a specific value. So the var uh, variance should become zero for infinite samples. Now, in part C, we were also asked to compare it to the prediction of the variance of the function f uh, over the number of draws. And so we can also overplot this. Ah, this works, great. And see that the trend line is definitely equal. Um, for my specific realizations, uh, it seems that the variance even is a bit smaller than what we would expect, which is not necessarily the case in all realizations of the data, but um, yes, this would be the gist of what you have to do in the exercise. If the other Johannes wants to add something, please no, That's good. Um, there's something in there. Okay. And yeah, no, I'm perfectly happy and I think we can move on. And okay. If you're still confused, if someone still has questions, you can ask the tutors in the next session as well. Okay, so let's get started with important sampling. So um, we realize that the effective number of samples is very small, that most of these samples go somewhere else. They are not being used on where most of the posterior is. So we have this sort of situation, we have this uniform, um, distribution and our target is just a very small part of this space and we had this Monte Carlo formula. But now let's imagine we make sort of an adaptive grid, we put more probability here and a bit less probability out here. So what if we did this orange situation, we draw samples more often where this target will be high we draw more and more samples there and very few out here, then we would get more samples with high, pro high likelihood, with high posterior. But so we draw, according, we draw some samples theta according to some proposal function, this orange one here. And um, sorry. And, um, but now we draw, we are sort of biasing ourselves to here. So any evaluation of our target function, that's this one on top, has to be downweighted 
by how often we would draw there, right? So we have to downweight by this orange curve all the sample samples that are drawn here. So we take our target and we reweigh it by this importance function, but otherwise it's the same formula. And you can imagine if I is the uniform distribution, it's exactly the same. So let's try this idea. We define a narrow Gaussian centered at 0 0.1, 0 0.1, because that's somewhere here, probably where the peak is. And so that's the center and the standard deviation of our Gaussian is also 0 0.1. And now we draw a bunch of points. We evaluate the likelihood. We make exactly the same plot. So here are our points. You see they are biased towards this region. We never draw out here. And um, maybe it's hard to see here, but maybe the more hit this high probability region. Now we know our proposal is biased. So we take the, the, the Gaussian probability distribution that we draw from, we know it, it's, a, it's a normal distribution and we can use this probability density function to look how biased each sample was. So for each sample, we evaluate the probability of our importance function. And that's what's shown here. That's just our Gaussian has high probability to be drawn here and low probability here. And now we just divide one by the other, as we said before. So instead of doing this, we divide by this importance weight, this one. And here it is. We again take the uh, likelihood, but this is now from the biased samples. And do we divide by this proposal importance? And we again compute the sum divided by n. So that's just the mean. And if I had run everything, then I would get here again my integral. And now we can ask, well, okay, now we have different weights. What's the effective sample size now? And the effective sample size is 100. And so you see that we have more samples in the interesting region. We have sort of a finer resolution of, of, our, of our target function. And now we can do a bunch of things with these uh, samples. We have the weights. And we can use those weights to look where most of the probability lies in this space. Here we just integrated or averaged them up, but we can actually look where the, most of that probability mass is. And here I just um, take the samples and use the weight and make a histogram. And here it is in parameter one and parameter two. These are the marginal posterior distributions. That's something we're interested in. And you can also take these weighted samples. They all have these weights attached to them. That's a bit annoying to carry around. Would be nice to have equally weighted samples. And we can do that by reject, uh, basically by um, drawing with repetition. And there's a nice function, numpy choice where we say, okay, here are our weights. We want the number is the effective number of samples, for example. And this tells us which one we should pick. And some might be repeated, that's okay. And in this case, then if we do this, we get posterior samples that are uniformly weighted. So all of them have equal probability to be the, the correct answer, if you will. And now we will break out again into breakout session. And you are asked to have a bit of a discussion on these issues um, and ask your tutors about any of the questions that came up so far. <laughs>
Okay. Then we will break out and I will take over Benedict's session because he had to leave uh, because he was not feeling so well. Okay, so let's do the breakout rooms again. Say again when we return. Um, we will return in, let's see what time is it now? Uh, let's keep it short, let's say um, half past. And we will have another breakout where afterwards where you can continue if you don't finish everything. So uh, 3.30. Okay. Francesca was typing something. All right, anyway, see you. Okay. Okay, um, so that's fine for you. Let me share the screen. Right. So I know it wasn't a lot of time, but maybe you can still think about these questions a little bit. Um, so Basically, the idea was that the ideal proposal would be the target proposal. So that, sorry, the target function itself. Then we would very efficiently generate points at exactly the right locations in our space. And the ratio would be a constant. That constant is the normalizing constant. Um, but we don't really know a way to generate samples like that. And you can think about why that is and how you could work around that. Okay, so now we have a short interlude and then we'll be in breakout rooms again. I just want to show you um, how we evaluate how good this important sampling is. So we already talked about the variance of this integral. And now um, before we use this uniform sampling and now we look at uh, this important sampling. And I think I accidentally changed notation here. So before I called this I, I think. So this is our importance um, proposal function. And we took the ratio of our actual function divided by this importance function to again, get rid of our sampling bias. And now the formula has also changed accordingly. So the variance of this integral is the variance of that ratio. And it again declines with the number of draws. And you can see that the variance um, becomes very small if one is proportional to the other, because then it's a constant, right? Then the variance on that would be zero. And let's try it out. So before, so now I will take the standard deviation instead of the variance. And we had this before, so we can take the weights from the un from the uniform sampling from the unbiased sampling. And here is the standard deviation offset. And we can take the standard deviation from important sampling. And here it is. And now you can discuss which method of those is better and whether this variance stuff, where does this come in in the effective size, uh, effective sample size number of samples formula. And then we will continue with the exercises, exercise two and three. The other two are homework exercises. And there's again a form which asks you what you learned today and then you're, you're free to leave.
So I will again stop here with the lecture and start the breakout rooms and interrogate your tutors and please uh, be active and turn on your cameras.